I start with an efflux announcement that we pushed out recently as Witte de Witt. In opposition to the strangling of museum spaces worldwide by rampant kudzu, that post-French, post-conceptual dance, dance we can't call dance, po-faced minimalism, feel-good participatory glibbery, aka too many seagulls, and performance with no qualities whatsoever, aside from its leeching of court-approved historical reference, aka fancy shoulder piggybacking, the breed of relational Stalinism arose in a theater internment facility in preoccupied Benelux in the early 20 teens. The primary tenets of relational Stalinism are emboldening confusion, logocratic exuberance, and antic behaviorism. Relational Stalinist works use a slippery iron fist to unbutton the viewer's buggy of self and catapult into a realm of truths only palpable through higher forms of irrationality. Good luck, translator, by the way. <laughs> this is a hard one, yeah. Thanks for trying, though. This advanced breed of world bending adopts the degree zero palette performance as a constraint, performers in a room that is, that pushes it out of its monochrome and into a pibotony of deviously vibrant offshoots which stretch participants' language and behavior in the service of invention. Da 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 da. So this was the press release we pushed out for Michael Portnoy's assembly of performances that um, took place on our exhibition floor at Witte de Witt that involved a troupe of dancers, actors, and improvisers. And basically, many registers of performance inhabited the different spaces of Witte de Witt at the same time Hendrik saw it, um, mixing in scrutinable sort of role-playing, um, experimental sketch comedy, theoretical soliloquies, um, operatic interludes, micro-dances, and sort of teary-eyed confessions. Part two. Why is it still hard to find a definition of what performance is? Initial definitions content themselves with saying that it involves time, space, body, audience, stage, and object. Yes, that's for five-year-olds. Yes, Judson Church. Yes, Marinetti. Yes, also Qingming candlelit renaissance. Even the very few who work in the field cannot quite grasp and articulate it. Writers have a very hard time to write performance, as you know. You, may, you have to know so many references that are encrypted in one live work. Yes, it is circular. Yes, it's a form of language. Yes, it's a transmission of ideas. It's the manifestation of a critical muscle, sometimes a political one. It's an instant rush of ideas into space, an energetic emission that is not by m no means a one-way stream. It's a form of processing affect. It's an instant transaction. In 2012, I curated on a tiny shoestring budget, I think it was like 70,000 euro, with Benjamin Cook of Lux in London, the Baltic Triennial in Vilnius. Instead of constructing a multi-platform, pluralist, all-encompassing exhibition that biennials tend to do, we turned the exhibition into a more condensed format, into a 12-day event focused exclusively on performance and film, where we presented the contributions of the artists through an extremely radicalized vessel, namely one human being. For us, it seemed interesting to focus on something else, not on the static, but on the human experience, even human nature, if you like, and the way human environment, humans in function in their environment today. As a team, we were also convicted that biennials should not necessarily do these giant productions that take insane productions to be able to transmit complex ideas and to be able to resonate with the context, you know, to put all these giant productions, but really play with the experimental spirit, which is much needed in the art world. We developed the concept with two artists again, Michael Portnoy and Ieva Misovicite. We wanted to choose someone, an actor, 
who is as empty as a subject as possible, a sort of a stereotype that lures you into thinking that you recognize it, yet once examined closer is in fact without a real character and ready for any manner of modification. We thought of someone who would be kind of the average Joe of Lithuania, so we chose this name Mindogas, which is a very common name, which means much wisdom, the one with many ideas and much fame. It's also that we wanted to work with celebrity as a medium initially, but then we turned it into this common man. So appearing each day throughout the triennial, our Mindogas, played by the theater actor Darius, was animated by different instructions and scripts to be played out in the city of Vilnius. The idea that the Mindogas would be directed every day by a different artist. It can also be the considered the primary exhibition space. So imagine the vessel, the body, through which the whole biennial is actually being pushed. People would be able to see him in various places in Vilnius at various times, engaged in different activities. The idea of using him as a medium for the artist's work is similar to certain schools of acting that treats an actor as an empty vessel. We ask each artist to fill that vessel to create Mindogas from scratch every day. In the, in the evening, Mindogas retreated and he fell asleep and he had dreams and nightmares. And the constellation of ideas he embodied during the day were transmuted by different performers. Do you hear me? Within a shifting stage environment that we called Charismateria. Here, charisma was posed as the prima materia, the alchemical first essence necessary for creation. In this black box space, performers from visual arts, but also from theater, presented works countering the anti-theatrical trend in the contemporary art world and proposing the idea that entertainment, stagecraft, and charisma can also be a platform for critique. That was in 2012. It was more than presence we wanted to test, dear Mario, which I heard you use the words. And presence is still this word that we use to be able to filter theatricality into the art world. That's the extent that art world allows charisma to, the, to itself. So in the evening, so we wanted to explore the process to refer to a metaphorical process. I wanted to also test how much of performance relates to dynamics of consciousness, the morphing of mutating of imagery of a process which emerges from and feeds into a stream of consciousness. So this was important, this charisma research. As a visual art viewer, we pay little attention to the fact whether the artist is charismatic or not. We really care more about the form and concept of an artwork. And usually that's, that's what works its magic. Script can be enormously boring if you think about it, if it's not enacted well. Think about all the videos that we have to see, you know, overwritten by that monotonous voice that we have to suffer through in every video art piece almost or think how the script can actually be elevated. So when Ivo Dimchev, an artist who would barely be received by the art world, his performance, when his performance started with the words, enjoy the waste, it depends so much on charisma, whether you feel like wasting your time with him and your attention or not. In some way, this research, as I said before, was meant to counter the tendency to exclude anti-theatricality from the art world. And to propose theatricality does not occupy one's mind only with visuality, leaving no space for thinking or contemplating. These spaces created for artistic and by artistic charisma are also spaces for contemplation, possibly. So we actually wanted to test this. Can, use, can one use charisma as a primary site and prime material for creation? What lies in charisma? some sort of living form of psychology, a projection of sorts in laboratory terms. It's an art, both experiential and experimental. Can we see it as a form of particle acceleration? I'm not that charismatic, by the way, on stage, but <laughs> I wish I could be, so I can actually accelerate it for you guys, too. So within charisma is also a theory of nature, a belief in the evolution and transformation of substance. The imitation of nature by a gentle technology, the conviction that one's inner being is changed by participation, also by internal and external experiments. 
a general system of synchronistic correspondences between space, light, stage, audience, curtains, various species, signs and symbols, and basically dealing with basic mysteries of life. Look, I've been in this for a while, and I've seen thousands of rehearsals and hundreds of performances. I was at Performa in New York at its very nascent stages before it was even a non-profit in New York. And the vision even in New York was to show you know, the best of performance from all around the world, and to be able to envision a dynamic art scene in New York that was reminiscent from the 60s of the down downtown art scene. And for those who don't know, Performa is started by an art historian, Rosie Goldberg, who basically indexed the history of performance, which probably Guillaume Dessange referred to a lot in his making of lecture performance. And the idea with performance also, Performa was also not to treat Performa as an amuse-bouche or as an appetizer, was a sidekick to an art fair, even though I feel we're in our nice little space. Here, the mission was really to be able to reset that perception and bring it a bit more central. And to be able to use filter, like performance as a filter to read various forms of art. And that could even be food, that could even be typography, that could even be architecture, Bernard Schumi and so forth. And I came from the school where visual art performance, which is mainly based on constructions on the constructions of narrative, references, concept and execution of its later, chosen to be live. And I've done it mostly, and thanks to that's the formula of Rosie Goldberg also, with artists who've never done it before. So I come from that walk of life. But getting frustrated also with all the possibilities on performance and seeing the trends in performance, recently at Witte de Wit, we um, organized a session called Performance Taxonomies which aimed at examining at current trades and breeds of performance seen at institutions and to be able to expand the possibilities and transmute the seeds of prevalent approaches to visual art performance as a form of generative critique. So from charisma research with Michael Portnoy now into horticulture, which Dan Fox is very familiar with. So his style of improving and grafting of so all of a sudden we're in botany, right? We want to look at seeds of trends in performance and cross-pollinate them and see what we can actually extract from that cross-copulation of different breeds. We do many prismatic public programs at Witte de Wit, and, um, and that's also thanks to my great team of Adam, who's also in Bogota today, probably somewhere checking on the referendum results again. <laughs> um, but um, what we did with this session is we invited critically engaged conspirators to think alongside with us to analyze the current typologies that exist in visual art performance from which speculative improvements could be structured and to be able to create a taxonomy of future breeds of performance based on the participant's specific area of expertise. The idea was also that this would transmute and slightly shift the parameters of what currently exists in the art world to open up new possibilities, be they utopian, comedic, or downright absurd. It's to enable possible future breeds as the natural endpoints of certain strains of present activity in the field of performance. The actors on stage were a museum curator who also works in the festival format, a pedagogue, a dramaturg, and of course, the artists. Their, pro their props? was their minds, their tongues, their words. The motivation was an exercise of language game, playing with the language used to describe the current subbreeds in the field of performance, in the art world, but also in theater dance, as they intermingle, collapse, collide over time and space, and tickle the white cubes, melancholic walls, and deeply secularized fluorescent lights that have been enshrined in a deep 20th century neutral visual aesthetic discourse. Participants were dared and they, and they were challenged to manipulate until new breeds could be born and generated. So imagining the performance, how performance will be looking like in the future, and then trying to abstract a breed that would contain it was the instruction. Imagining two subbreeds of dance copulating and what type of offsprings would they actually be giving way to. So it's also a bit of a mind game, right? Like, 
Is there enough institutional understanding of the various vocabularies that would come to play together? Are there types of operations and processes once deemed unfashionable, but perhaps now are ripe for reinvention in the future? Like, think of how happenings were now left out from the art world. What are your pet peeves in the field of performance, we ask to the participants. So mine, for instance, would be like pee or poo or vomit or blood, which you've seen in the 60s and 70s enough that you know, I can't see it anymore in the art world. What would you prune out in the field that was already in the 70s in Colombia or in New York, Moscow, Erivan, Beijing in the 80s? An equally well-known curator had already indexed, luckily, the current taxonomies in the most generous way. She was unbelievable, but she doesn't allow me to mention her name in public. But she made it available for circulation to the session's participants who accepted to perform their own variation as well. Let me tell you what I mean with it, with the taxonomy, which is a continuation of, I think, Guillaume Desange's lecture performance, left it yesterday. Artists who make live work specifically for museums and gallery contexts. Artists who make scored and scripted live actions to be performed in the gallery, but also make work in other media, like Roman Ondak, Elm Green Draxet, Dora Garcia. Artists who make only scored and scripted live actions to be performed in the gallery, and don't make work in other media, Tino Segal. Artists who make only scored and scripted live actions to be performed in the gallery, but don't make work in other media, but after Tino Segal, that would be Oliver Beer, Caroline Duyar. Artists who worked out early on that it was possible to perform a kind of object drag on such live work to make it collectible, Tino Segal, Roman Ondak. Artists who have since worked out that it was possible to perform a kind of object drag to live to, to on live work to make it collectible, even retrospectively, there are too many lists, but Marina Abramovic. Artists who agree to show their work in galleries but make it impossible to collect. Yvonne Rayner, Trio A, instead she has given it away for free by teaching it. Artists who present themselves as the artwork by simply being present. Marina Abramovic. Actors who present themselves as the artwork in a misguided remake of Cornelia Parker artwork. Tilda Swinton at MoMA. Pop stars who perform as global superstars very much outside of museums and galleries, but nevertheless claim that they are artists behind the scenes, secretly, Kanye West, and think. Artists who make live work specifically for museums and gallery contexts at the invitation of curators and producers. Biennials of live work by artists who were not necessarily making live work before. So that's kind of the policy of Performa where I came from. Live exhibitions of artists where artists were not necessarily making live exhibitions before. The 14 rooms that you saw, or the move from video by Ed Atkins, or the robot of Jordan Wolfson. And art fair prizes encouraging artists to make more live work than ever to show in the art fair context. Freeze Live, Artissima. Artists who use dance and dancers who use art. Visual artists borrowing ready-made dance movements and styles. Artists borrowing historical style in order to queer public space, Pablo Bronstein. Artists borrowing historical styles such as early painting and design, 20th century painting and design, Polina Olovska, live poetry, Maitu Pere, Bauhaus yoga. Artists working with retired dancers who carry dance heritage that they so they can reperform fragments of it in the gallery, Nina Bayer. Artists borrowing ritual mystic dance forms, not intended to be seen as choreography per se, but showing them as art. Germaine Kraup, whirling dervish performance. Artists borrowing vernacular dance formats, such as nightclub, instead of historical styles, and making it more fun for the audience participants to create what they call an occasion that also includes beer. Single nights using Yutha Kothar painting as props, A. Arakawa. Artists using gold painted and semi naked dancers dancing to the urban dance music and roller skating in the gallery, Eddie Peak. Artists using dance improvisation and other contemporary dance strategies and collaborating with contemporary dancers to make forms of sculpture installation, Ian White and Jimmy Robert, Jimmy Robert and Maria Hasabi. Visual artists using rules and structures in a choreographic way to engender new kinds of social interaction. 
Artists who organize a whole village from the Czech Republic to travel abroad and make them dance in a circle when they get there, Katerina Seda. Artists who appeal for communities to collaborate filmmaking or collaborate on filmmaking to foster new relationships, Marinella Senatore. Artists who set up participatory games using scores and systems that resemble fluxes but updated, Koki Tanaka. And choreographers. Choreographers who make work in theaters that connects with art conceptually but don't necessarily make work in museums and galleries, Jérôme Bell, Jérôme Bell in 94. Choreographers who make work in galleries and connects with art conceptually but remain skeptical about the idea of choreographers making work in galleries, Xavier Leroy, retrospective, Pompidou in 2014. Choreographers whose work is made of minimal or repeated form resembling sculpture, hence having a formal place in galleries, like the wheels, Anna Teresa Kersmacher. Choreographers who conceive of work of both gallery and theater, even call their dance center of museum, Boris Shamat, Musée de la Danse. Choreographers who collaborate a lot with artists because they have a long history of working and thinking together, Michael Clark. Choreographers who collaborate with a lot of artists because producers suggest that they work together because it looks good, Akram Han and Anthony Gormley. Choreographers who stop dancing, turn to visual art, rethink subjectivity in space, and are much less successful, are much more successful there, Tino Segal. Choreographers who make extended ambiguous art dance events, situations out of ready-made things and pop music and complain about other dancers being shown in galleries, Martin Spangberg. Choreographers who present the same work in a gallery installation version and on stage at the theater, Alexander Bachiches. I mean, this can go on, 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 on. So I have actually a whole list that came from the curator. And I'm sorry that it doesn't include enough from this continent. This didn't come really via me. It's a very sort of North European index selection. And it doesn't include you yet, Kelly, but I bet you will be included in that indexation and you will have allergic reactions to being pinned down in a... 140 character liner. So this is probably a continuation of where we left it yesterday. But if you're lost, this was the taxonomy of performance that we fed to the participants of the symposium to work with. So the curator in the symposium didn't bite to the challenge, like the taxonomy I just presented, which was given to us by a renowned performance curator but involuntarily embedded the institutional conundrum by offering a taxonomy that is, again, for five-year-olds. Art on stage, object on stage, performer on stage, yeah, that's performance. Her approach to taxonomies was immediately addressed by other participants who argued that the future of performance was very much dependent on the ways within which the institution moves in the field and adopts, appropriates, transforms the medium. According to the pedagogue, the Heavy Mammoth Museum was so unwilling to take on the risk to study and work with the various typologies and breeds and vocabularies, such as that theater, for instance. The after the session dinner, the conclusion was that the theater was for plebeians and was not welcome to the high temple of art. Surprisingly, the tenuous and precarious relationship between the image picture making and the performance, as it's heavily performed within the contours of art history, but also demands supply chain of market and institutional appetite was not addressed. The image and the performance, the chicken and the egg. Their dance is yet to be reconceived in entirely new ways, responded the dramaturg, and disseminated online, offline, everywhere. That's the next revolution, the current future. In addition to the chicken, we also realized that there was an elephant that shapeshifted as a seagull. How especially the critique as induced by Tino Segal himself has now transformed itself, willingly or unwillingly, into a mammoth marketing medium for museums, no one really mourned. Was the resulting confluence at the medium's potency as a, as a site to test new ideas and presences and its eternal resilience, because performance really has that capacity to shapeshift, right? And basically, at the end of the session, we still didn't have the question whether an immediate concern or consciousness was required for image still in 2016, you know, after all those discussions of performance documentation. And we really didn't get there. Well, we try, you know, every, every symposium, every session, 
every format where we can invent, so we're not necessarily bound by the parameters that are, have already been indexed, that have already been figured out, bless you, um, are constantly applied and not challenged. And it's kind of important to embark on these exercises where we can actually look, let's say, to charisma. You know, why is theater not allowed into the art world? And maybe some of you have more answers to that, or that theatricality. And it's sort of seeping in, of course, in, into the museum spaces. But not quite. I mean, yesterday you didn't get an answer to your question. Um, so on that note, it was very industry specific, I think. So for those who are not really initiated yet to the field of performance, I apologize. But those who are actually in the field probably got some of my concerns through my presentation. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer. And if I blocked all of you <laughs> with all my And a lot of these interests, I mean, are fed by the artists that I collaborate with. So in that sense, it's really Michael Portnoy has been a great collaborator for about 10 years. And we've been sort of pushing different elements, whether we do a variety theater to test the underbelly of the New York scene or whether we condense a biennial through an actor's body or whether we kind of look how charisma can work in the space. Okay, on that note, I'm going to wrap it up. If there are questions, I'm happy to take it. Good. I thought so. 